Praise God. You glad to be at church? Come on. No better place to be than on Wednesday night than right here with your brothers and sisters in Christ and the Spirit of God here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to go ahead and read you scripture, our text from tonight, for, uh, for tonight. John chapter 15. I want to minister to you out of John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and starting in verse 5, Jesus says this. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides, say abide. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and he is withered, and they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide, say abide. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. I want to talk to you guys tonight about abiding in the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we just give this night over to you. I thank you, Jesus, for your word. I thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, teach your church tonight. Lord, I know each and every person in here tonight, you know them better than anyone else. And I pray, God, that you'll speak to them exactly what they need to hear. Lord, we just put our expectation on you tonight, no one else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Harvest Church, I love you. I'm so glad you guys are here tonight. So like I said, I want to talk to you about abiding in the word. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. I've learned so much uh, as, I've, as I'm growing, as I'm learning, as I'm maturing, that, um, that the more I strive to do things, the more I mess it up. The more I try to put my effort into it, the more I get in my own way. And so many times, we get in our own way more than we, more than we want to admit. When things don't work out this way or that way, it's real easy to blame these different things, all these different scenarios. But when you learn to abide in Christ, essentially you're getting out of your own way, leaning on him and allowing his grace and mercy to dictate how you take your next steps. Abiding in him is so essential to what God has called us to do as disciples. And no matter what situation that you're in, Right now, I don't, I don't know what, whatever is going on, I promise you this, that if you can learn to abide even more than you are now, you're going to be better off on the other side of whatever you're in. Abiding in him is where God has called us to be. You know, we're, we've been called to, to, uh, to, to have close uh, relationship with the Heavenly Father. We once were separated because of sin. But, but now the blood of Jesus has drawn... All, <laughs> King James Version, this is King James putting it, draw nigh by the blood of Christ, right? Draw nigh, that's, that's a lot of old teaching inside in, in here, King James coming out. But being brought close to him because of the blood of Jesus so that we can have communion with him and to abide in him. So Jesus says that he, that, that he is the vine and we are the branches. Say, I'm not the vine. Yeah, we ain't the vine. He's the vine. The vine is where the life comes from. We simply live from the life source. And, and if I'm going to be honest with you, I have, to be, I have to remind myself of that more times than I'd like to admit. That this is, I'm not, this is not the life source here. He is. That means the actions, the thoughts that I take are not dictated here or by me. They're dictated by him. And what his word has to say. So that means he gets to define what peace looks like in my life. He gets to define what success looks like in my life. He defines what love is. He defines all those different things because he is our life source. Amen? Y'all with me tonight? So I want to touch on some things. We're going to make our way through John chapter 15 and, uh, and, and the way that I'm presenting this tonight is, may seem a little bit different for, for me because I just want to kind of highlight some things I believe the Lord has shown me and just present them to you. It's simple enough, right? I'm going to make my way through here. And, uh, and the first thing I want to show you is this. I've seen three results from abiding 
in Jesus. Okay, according to the scriptures that we just read, John chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. And the first one is this, is that abiding produces fruit. Jesus said, if uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He tags on there and says, for without me, you can do nothing. Apart from the vine... The branches cannot bear fruit. It's impossible. If you cut a limb off of a tree, it, it will eventually, those leaves will turn brown and they will shrivel up and they will die and that tree will not bear fruit any longer because it's not connected to the source. Jesus is saying the same thing. If we need to bear fruit, we have to be connected to the source, but abiding in him is what produces fruit, not the striving, not the working. See, fruit isn't manufactured. Fruit is grown. There's a difference between the two. Car engines, they're manufactured. There's a lot of other things that are manufactured in this, comp- in this country, but I can't think of another one right now. <laughs> We're just sick with car engines. They're manufactured, but you can't manufacture an apple or a banana. You got to grow it. There had to be a tree that started at a, as a seedling to grow, li- live a whole, whole series of its life, years of its life, without being able to bear fruit. To, got to the point where it was mature enough to get to bear fruit, and then the fruit had to grow. This thing takes time. It's not, it's not within our strength. Any fruit that you carry in your life that's worth holding on to, it's because it's been grown, it's been cultivated. It hasn't been manufactured. A lot of people like to promote and, and, and say they're self-made. I, you know, I got me here. No, no, no. Anything that's going to last, and when, and, when, and when the Heavenly Father talks about lasting, he's talking about eternity. He's not talking about a 50-year span. He's not even talking about a lifetime, 100 years. Mm-mm. Eternity. Fruit that would remain, he says later in the chapter. But the first thing I saw was that fruit, uh, abiding produces fruit. And that we bear the fruit. Those who abide in him bear the fruit. We're the fruit bearers. Did you know no one else can bear your fruit? I can't walk in peace that Leon's got. I got to grow that fruit in my spirit. Can't walk in, I can't walk in the revelation my wife has. I got to get that. Now, she can help me. Hallelujah, and she does. <laughs> Thank the Lord. But there's a time where we have to learn how to carry our own fruit. We got to learn how to abide ourselves so that fruit can grow on the inside of us. Now, my kids, they're gleaning off my tree right now. But when we step out there in time for maturity, we got to learn how to carry the fruit. And I, think it's, I think it's amazing that Jesus says that the Father's glorified when we carry fruit. Isn't that interesting? Because, man, he could have set this thing up where he carries all the fruit. And we just look at it and admire him. And if he wanted to set it up that way, I guess he could have. But he chose not to. He chose for the fruit, for us to be the fruit bearers and to carry the fruit that way. Last point I want to say about us um, bearing fruit and, and how abiding in him bears fruit is this. We will misidentify fruit in our life and the lives of others if we think fruit is a luxury to make our lives easier. What I mean by that, I'm, a, I'm big on purpose. Everything, God does everything. He just, he's so purposeful in how he set all of this up. I'm talking about life. <laughs> He's just so purposeful in how he set up, you know, seed, time, harvest, sowing, reaping. He's purposeful in how he's done all of this. And he's purposeful on what he means when he says we'll carry fruit. Too often in my life I've made the mistake of of falling under the impression that if I have much fruit in my life, then my life just simply gets easier because I've, I've gotten good things. 
That's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about fruit, we are, remember, what is, in the context of what he's talking about, he is the vine, we are the branches. We are literally growing the essence of who he is, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when, a banana tr- when I get a banana off a banana tree, I don't look at the branch and say, what a magnificent branch. You look at the tree, right? That's a good tree. It's all about the tree. We've put too much emphasis on the fruit. But it's about abiding within the vine. Jesus also says, helps us, uh, teaches us, and, and helps us uh, by teaching us that, that in order for us to identify certain things in our life and certain people in our life, to judge them by their what? Fruit. To judge them by their fruit. But if you have a misunderstanding of what he means by fruit, you may think someone's walking in abundance when they are not. You may have a misunderstanding, well, this person is, has a whole lot of this or, or they're doing a whole lot of that. So what's, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're walking in fruit. I believe this, the be, as I was meditating on this and thinking about this, I believe the best way for us to identify fruit is how many people are growing because of that person. How many people are growing? Not congregations, individual people are growing because of this person. Because if you think about it, the fruit that an apple tree grows is not for the benefit of the branch that it's hanging on. It's for the benefit of the one who can come and partake of it, right? Of the one around it. It's to be a blessing for someone else. So any fruit in my life, if I want to say I have fruit in my life, it's something that someone close to me can glean from. If I carry the fruit of patience, my children is going to glean from that. The first thing, I've been, I was thinking about this. What, I wonder what the first thing that they would recognize in me as far as the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm convinced it's love. It's the first thing they recognize. And I, I, would, I would present the same thing to you. I think anybody that first meet, met you, they would first recognize your love walk or not, and then everything falls from there. Because if I, if you, if I were to have my son up here, and I was going to bring him up here if he was going to be in here, but... Anyhow, he's not here. But if I were to bring him up here and I were to ask him, you know, what, what's the favorite thing? What's your favorite thing about daddy? He may something, say something silly like, he tickles me. I love how he tickles me. Or Cana, Cana concurs. That's it. For whatever reason, that kid loves to be tickled. I don't know. Cana doesn't understand it. She hates it. <laughs> like, for real, hates it. <laughs> it ain't funny. Gabriel loves it, but it, I don't have a, a, a tickle fruit. <laughs> what is he recognizing in my life? Love. Spending time with him. Spending time with him. I think, I think if I were to ask Micah what he loves about his daddy would be something too effective of allowing him to play restaurant. That kid loves to bake. He's four years old. He loves to do that. What is that? Spending quality time with him. He loves that. That's the love the, to be with him. That's, so, so fruit is not something to benefit me. However, it's something that has been produced in me, cultivated in me by my heavenly father. And according to Jesus, my proximity to him by choosing to abide in him so that I can be a blessing to those around me. And here's the thing, I've never had an apple tree force an apple down my throat. It's there for those willing to receive. People who carry great fruit understand that if they just learn to just lean on Jesus, if they learn to just lean on Jesus and abide in him, that they're going to be a blessing to those around them, almost by a byproduct of just simply being in him. You don't have to strive. You don't have to, I got to go get some revelation so that I can go then share it with this. 
No, no, no. Believe me. We pray to the Lord of the harvest for those that we're trying to reach, but we rest on the cornerstone, like Vic was saying. We rest in that place. And we allow the fruit to speak for itself. And when someone tastes and sees that the Lord is good, then they'll keep coming back to that place. So the first thing, again, the first thing I saw in, in abiding was that, was that abiding bears fruit. It helps us to abe- uh, bear fruit. The second thing for those who abide in him, their prayers are answered when we abide. What does Jesus say? He says, if you, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is conditional, right? God Almighty is not your personal genie. (laughs) He has a will. He has a purpose. And he's clearly stated it right here. So Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask whatsoever you desire, we desire, and it will be done for you. So many times we hear this scripture and all we hear is, We ask what we desire and it'll be done for me. Amen. That ain't all of it. That ain't all of it. So so if I'm looking in the context of what Jesus is saying here, I can conclude this. That abiding in him has a lot to do with what his word has to say and me leaning into it. Second thing he says is he says, once I've done that, then I'll ask what I desire. That tells me that when my mind is being transformed and being renewed according to the word of God, my desires should follow that change. Right? Jesus did not give place for just anybody to come in with and ask for whatever they desire. He gave place for those who are abiding in him and his word abiding in them. This abiding concept is a is beautiful and you can use different terminology for it i'm going to go ahead and and give you the definition for it now that word abide it means to stay in a given place state relation to or a relation or expectancy continue dwell ensure be present remain stand All of those things you have to choose to do, right? But in the context of what Jesus is talking about this, it is talking about us just staying in that place. But it's he also talks about him being in us, us in him and him in us. It's a two-way thing. The closest thing that I can come to that really explains this is marriage. When two come together, they're made one. I am just as much Cana's husband as she is my wife. It's both ways. You're saying the same thing, just different ways. Yeah, I am. Jesus is saying the same thing, just different ways too. We're in him and he's in us. Together. But specifically, he helps us out. Jesus is a great teacher. And he helps us out. He gives us a little glimpse into what it means for him to abide in us. And he says, his word abides in us. Scripture says that when we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. So that tells me that one of the ways that, that I can draw near to him is I can open up this book right here. And I can say, Holy Spirit, help me because you are a helper. Help me know my heavenly father better. I, I want to know you more. And I begin to read. And when I draw close to him, he draws near to me. Amen. And then in that place, in that place where my heart is fixed on his, I'll ask whatsoever I desire, and it shall be done for me. Amen? So the first thing that I saw about abiding was that when those who abide, they bear much fruit. Jesus expands on that even more. We're not going to get to it tonight, but he says fruit that would remain. Prayers are answered by those who abide in him. And the last thing... Oh, man, I almost skipped this. I can't skip this. This quote is so good. 
The second thing was what the prayer are answered by him. Remember in that place when we're abiding in him? It's about communion. It's another word that you can use when we're talking about this, communion with the Heavenly Father. I have a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, Abe, helped me out with this, and he, he found this quote. We were talking about it a couple weeks ago, and I had the opportunity to put in my message tonight. And I said, hey, man, shoot me that, shoot me that uh, quote. This is from Oswald Chambers. He says this, prayer is not getting things from God. That is a most initial stage. Prayer is getting into perfect communion with God. I tell him what I know he knows in order that I may get to know it as he does. I'm going to read it again. Prayer is not getting things from God. That is the most initial stage. Prayer is getting into perfect communion with God. I tell him what I know he knows that I may come to know it as he does. I tell him what I know he knows. That means I bring his word back to the throne room, not because I think he doesn't know it. I tell him what I know he knows so that I can gain his perspective about it. And from that place, we ask whatsoever we desire, and it will be done for us. This leaning into him is meant to be so easy. We've complicated it. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and I can't remember exactly where it's at, but he says that I fear, just as Eve was deceived in the garden, that you would also be deceived from the simplicity that's in Christ Jesus. There's a simplicity that the enemy would like to make confusion in. There's a simplicity found in Christ in this walk with him that man and man's traditions would like to make it confusing. We need to guard this place, this, this holy, this reverent, this very intimate place of abiding in Jesus because in that place, that's where revelation comes and that's where peace is and that's where the simplicity is found, in Jesus. I can find peace and I can find simplicity and whatever, what I mean by that is this, is that even though I may not know exactly the answer to, to this situation, I know who, who is the answer. You know what I'm saying? That means I don't have to go searching. I just lean into him. Okay. The last thing I saw that, that, that uh, I saw in abiding is this. Number three, abiding glorifies God. Abiding glorifies God. Jesus said in verse 8 of chapter 15 in John, uh, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. I've made this mistake. I'm teaching out of my mistakes a lot tonight, I guess. <laughs> but I've made this mistake, that my fruit, I only, I, only, um, I, I only put my attention on the fruit that glorifies God. 100% the fruit glorifies God. But if you have a misunderstanding of what fruit is, then you're trying to take your works and show it to him. Do you like this, Jesus? Oh, no. Do you like this one? Do you like this one? Trying to live for approval. Because my, my fruit, my, you said my fruit's supposed to glorify you. But that, that fruit is in the context of just abiding in him. I will be able to reach with great expectation the more that I learn to abide and allow the vine dresser to cultivate and to maintain and to grow that fruit in me. Not trying to reach with great expectation within my own strength, within my own power, but lean in him. Because when I lean in him and I know that place and I know his voice, obedience comes much easier. As, as a young believer, as I was growing, I guess I'm still young. I guess it's all relative, right? I remember in my teenage years, we'll put it that way, early 20s, I remember thinking that, that I had to 
do, this is just another way of saying what I've already said, I've had to do things in order, and it's almost like I was doing them in a way that was trying to prove to myself that this works. You know what I mean? Have you ever been there? You ain't got to wave your hand. Maybe I'm the only one here. But it's like, I need to do all of these things so that and then, okay, well, does that work, Lord? Is, because I see in your work. I've got, I had it backwards, and I was running myself, and I was getting frustrated. But when I put, I was putting the cart before the horse. When I lean into the vine, I will never be a vine. We will never reach that status. We've fallen short of that glory. But I lean into him. And just allow him to define who I'm supposed to be. Allow him to dictate my purpose. Allow him to define my identity. Allow him to dictate my desires and the things that I want. And from that place, I can become a doer of the word. Yeah. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Amen. That secret place, that one-on-one place is where we learn to abide in Him. We need to put priority on meeting with Jesus. Every day. We have to, and I, man, I, I guess I'm not only just talking to young adults here, but young adults, if you're listening, listen up. We have to stop trying to figure out where to fit by the Bible in our schedule. And we have to learn how to set it first and allow everything to fall into place after that. If you do that, you'll begin to see fruit growing in your life. You begin to see your purpose unveiling in front of you. It's the truth. But you got to make him, the Bible, a, a, a scriptural word is, is he's preeminent. He carries preeminence. He's above all and before all. Jesus is the true vine. He said it himself in verse 1 of chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. The vine that he's asking us to abide in is one of authenticity. It's one of truth. Jesus is, it's it's almost as if he's implying here that there are false sources of life. That there are false vines that we could find ourselves abiding in. Living for the approval of others. Living for self-gains. Alcohol, drugs, money, other gods, whatever we're exalting above him, looking for a place where we would get life from, searching for something when there's one true vine. His name is Jesus. If you don't know him, we'll give you an opportunity to know him before you leave tonight. But there is one place that we can come to to get the life. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. We must be connected to the true vine in order to be a beneficiary of the life abundantly that Jesus promised. Jesus says that the thief comes not before to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that you may have life and life abundantly. That life and abundant life that he's talking about is talking about when we are hooked up to the true vine. Now, I said that there's the the true vine. He's he's authentic. We use that word a lot, authentic. We actually have authentic women here, right? Amen. Come on. Authentic women. We have brave men. I ain't going to leave you all out either. Brave men in the house. Got three or four of you here. <laughs> but that word authentic or, or authenticity, I have some thoughts on that I want, that I feel like I should share with you. The best way to recognize authenticity is to be well acquainted with truth. Okay, 
if we don't know what truth is, it's going to be really hard to, pick in, to point out people who are authentic. You will not be able, and I'm going to take it another step further, you will not be able to truly identify what truth is, truly identify what truth is, without knowing the truth. Without knowing the true vine. Too often we make the mistake of only recognizing, or let me say it this way. We like to call people authentic who are just simply relatable. Does that make sense? Let me, let me, let me explain what I'm saying here. Although Jesus, there is no one more relatable than Jesus. He's been with, he can relate to everybody because he is the perfect truth, right? So there is a relatability that comes with authenticity. But if we don't know the truth of the word of God, we'll stop at, at our lack of understanding and only think people who are relatable to us are authentic. I make this mistake in, in high school way too much. And I can tell you in my high school, I had a group of people who thought, who, that you had all these different types of people. You had people who really liked to skateboard, and you had people that liked to, liked to rap and freestyle, and then you had people who, who liked to play sports, and you had people who liked to wear Lacosta and flip-flops and drink certain type of drinks after school at eight. No, anyway. You had all these different types of people, because they try to find stuff that's relatable to them and they think that oh that's that must they're authentic I like them if you simply surround yourself with people who are relatable you'll get comfortable but if you surround yourself with people who are authentic you'll grow the reasoning being is because the truth within those authentic people will confront some things in you that need to be grown but if you're only thinking that people are authentic and you're surrounding yourself with authentic people who are just simply relatable, you get comfortable and you stop growing. But so how, again, we're asking the question, we're just circling this thing. It's okay. How am I going to be able to recognize a true authentic person? I got to know the true vine. Because he is the one who knows good from evil. He set it up that way. He knows the right way. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The last part of my message is I want to talk to you about connecting with him. I want to talk to you about communing with him. We've hit on it. We've talked about abiding in him. I just want to bring it out in this light as well. We'll read this again. John 15, 7, uh, 7, verse 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for, done for you. I want to focus on that abiding in him and he in us and specifically his word in us. We have been, cr been created for connection with the Heavenly Father. We were not meant to do this life alone and just hope that God helps us out when we're in a spot that's, that's tough. We are meant to do it with him always. Scripture says that the just, they live by faith. Every day, that's how they live. The just, what do you mean? Those who have been justified by the blood of Jesus. If you're a believer, that means you. If you're having a hard time living, I suggest make faith a lifestyle. <laughs> Seek what the Holy Spirit has to say to you about that if you're still having questions. God will always choose to lead us primarily through relationship. God will always choose to lead us primarily through relationship. We get the, we, so too often we get the, this idea that God is sitting up on this high throne pointing his finger and telling us which way to go. No. 
He's the God who goes before me. We follow him. He's with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. And in that same scripture in Isaiah, it says, he's my rear guard. He's got my back too. He's meant to do it with us. And the thing about relationships is that they'll starve without communication. Relationships will starve without proper communication. I'm learning that so much as a father. I'm continuing to learn that almost 12 years of marriage now. Relationships are, I mean, if you're seeing growth in your marriage, if you're seeing growth in your friendships, if you're seeing growth in any relationship, I bet it's because you've had open communication with them. And it doesn't change with God. I've been coming to church, and I don't feel like I've grown a lick in the last year and a half. Have you been talking to Jesus? Have you been talking to Jesus? Oh, man, this is my favorite. This pastor, he's just not my style. I can't, I'm just not. Let the Holy Spirit grow you. Get into the Word of God. Lean on him. Have communication with him. What was said today? What was said tonight that you can pull on? If this is a hard lesson for you to understand, grab something and say, Lord, show me. What was being said here? What did I miss? And I'm telling you, you take that approach, you're going to start growing much faster than you would think. I promise you that. Relationships will starve without communication. And this was a game changer for me. I'm just going to be open and honest with you. I guess I've been honest with you the whole night. But for me, I was, uh, I was at Rama, and I was surrounded by a lot of other people who were wanting to step into ministry and, and uh, wanting to grow in their knowledge and relationship with God. And I'm, and I'm looking at my instructors and they're teaching stuff, and I'm like, I ain't on that level. <laughs> Not there. And so I began to seek the Lord. I'm like, God, I recognize that I've got to learn how to read this Bible. But I do not like to do it. <laughs> I do not like to do it. <laughs> I fall asleep. I do all this stuff. And, and so I remember one day I opened up to John chapter 1. And I saw this for the first time, and this, like I said, this was a game changer for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill you in on what the Lord showed me, and I pray it blesses you. Remember, if we're going to grow with the Lord, it's going to be done through relationship, and relationships start without communication. So we're going to have to strengthen our relationship with God through communication, right? And this is the number one way that he's communicating to us is the word. So if I'm not getting the word like I should, there's a block here that i got to get through. My God's a good heavenly father. The, the primary way for me to communicate to him, he would not make it something that I should despise doing. I should enjoy this. So I recognized there was something in me that I needed to change and that needed to be changed. So I just, okay, I'm, and I saw this. John chapter 1 verse 1, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was was life, and the life was the light of men. If you skip down to verse 14, he goes on and he says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I got the revelation that my Savior was the Word of God taken upon flesh for me. And and, and when I saw that, my eyes opened up to, this isn't just a text anymore. This is the heart of my Savior who went to the cross for me, where where I get life from, my true vine. Because... 
I never had connection with a text. I didn't know how to do that. But I can have relationship with a person. And when I saw that he was the word of God taken upon flesh, there's so much revelation in that. But it made me want to get to know my Bible more. It made me want to step into that. And so what I've done, for any of you that it may help, I I just felt led to, to share my routine and what I do in the morning. When I get up in the morning, I go and I make my coffee. I take my cup of coffee right on up to my, to my study. I have a spot. I have a great desk that I love using. And, and I get up there and I sit down. And I go for the purpose of meeting him. Not for the purpose for him to say something to me. Or, excuse me, not for the purpose of me to say something to him. I go for the purpose just to lean into him. And so I get there, I get my coffee, and I stop, and I start with thanks. Because the Bible says that when we come with thanksgiving and praise, we enter into into his presence. Because I never want to read this without his presence. Someone once said, "Um, to never read the Bible as if the author wasn't in the room with you. And it was brought to, in the light in this, in this particular sense. If there was a certain author that you liked to read and you were reading their book and, and, and you had a question about what was being read there, would you just close it and walk away and say, I don't get it? What would you do? You would ask them. So if I'm aware that the author is in the room with me, if I come along something that I don't get, I'm just going to ask him. So to make sure, the Bible says we enter into his presence with thanksgiving and with praise. So I just start, God, I thank you that this is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for grace and mercy. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my pastors. I thank you for my church that I get to go to. I just start with thanksgiving and then I pray in the spirit. And I wait on him. I pray in the spirit. I just wait on him to show up. Pray in other tongues. That's what I mean by praying in the Spirit. If you're like, what's he talking about? And then when I, when I know that he's there, I may have things that I know that I want to talk to him about. But to give him, it's just, this is just me, guys. But to give him the honor that I, that I believe he deserves, I say, Lord, before I say anything, is there anything that you'd like to say this morning? Is there anything you want to talk to me about first? And I'm going to be honest with you, it's rare that I ever hear something in that place, but it's not about that. It's giving him that place. It's giving him that. If he needs to, he's got it. So I, and then after I wait a little bit, then I have scriptures that I like to pray. I like to pray the Ephesians scriptures. There's a scripture in Colossians that I like to pray. I like to go to Psalm 27, and I pray those out every day. And then I go to my reading. Then I go to start praying and talking to him after I've done those things. Because the purpose of my time with him is not to gain knowledge. It's to grow relationship Because when I'm going, in the moment where we got to make a split decision about this or that, I know the voice on the inside. Because I've spent time in the secret place. And I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He'll take care of me. Amen? Y'all get something about abiding tonight? Hallelujah. Stand up with me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're so good. If you do not know Jesus like that, if you've never met him before, all you have to do is just ask him to be Lord over your life. And immediately he'll come into your heart and he'll start this beautiful journey of relationship. If if you're like, man, there's things missing in my life 
and I want to have communication with the Lord like that, I need, to st- I need to take care of some things. When I begin to pray, I want you to just seek what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight. And be obedient to those tweaks and those adjustments that he's bringing to your heart. It's for your benefit. Right? So if you don't know Jesus tonight, nobody else looking around, just me. Just wave at me. Say, I'd like to know him. Will you pray for me? Include me in the prayer. Thank you, Lord. I'll take that as everybody in the house knows our king. That's great. Praise God. I'm just giving you a moment. If there's anything that you need to get settled with him, I just sense the Holy Spirit ministering to hearts right now. So if if there's anything that he needs to do, just, just listen on the inside. If if you need to repent, go ahead and take care of that. Whatever it is. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you're so good. Lord, you're so good. I thank you that you know your church. You know your people. You know your bride. Oh, I thank you, God, that we're moving uh, on from here, uh, moving from glory to glory strengthening our faith, knowing you more. And God, I just pray for that passion and desire to abide in you, Heavenly Father. If there's those in here where that fire seems to have waned, God, I pray you'd reignite it by the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have a group, this family, this Harvest Church family is a family who loves the Word of God. Oh, and I thank you, God. If there's anything hindering our devotions with you on a daily basis, Lord, I pray that that, uh, you'll bring it up to us. And Lord, if there's something on our end that we need to handle, I pray, God, we take care of it right now. But if there is anything, I come against any kind of confusion or any kind of uh, uh, block, anything that's that's blocking uh, anything in our lives, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I command those walls to come down right now in Jesus' name. Your word says that Jesus has broken down the middle wall of partition. And I thank you, Lord, that that that, that lie of the enemy, that there's any kind of gap any longer, has to go in Jesus' name. Oh, I thank you, God, that we're learning to abide in you, and we're going to carry the fruit that you're cultivating in our lives and bring you glory doing it. Lord, it's a pleasure to serve you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.